We are so glad that you joined us today. God wants to do so much for you and through you, and we want to hear about it. So take a moment to share your story with us at mystory@lbtlima.org. If you would also like to contribute financially to this ministry, you can do so at limabaptisttemple.org. Or you can download our church app available for iPhone and Android users. Thanks again for joining us. We hope you enjoy today's message. All right, good morning, church. Welcome to Lima Baptist Temple. Let's go ahead and stand together. Let's sing this morning, and let's worship our Creator.
Father, we welcome you here today. Father, your Holy Spirit, Father, show up in a mighty way. Change hearts and change lives today. God, I pray that we would be receptive to hear what you want us 
to hear today. God, I thank you for the, the kids' choir and the power of the message of the gospel that was brought forward today. Lord, we thank you for that. God, I pray today that we would never take our salvation for granted. God, we want to live, we want to walk in the freedom that you have given us. God, thank you so much for us being able to be free in you. God, we are saved, we are redeemed, we are forgiven forever. Let us never forget that. a river of gladness that pours from the man who wells veins. The sinner was plunged beneath the flood and God saved. Since then I walk in forgiveness. All of my guilt was erased. Of the past, a broken at last, I got saved. Oh, I got saved. I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. He got a hold of my life. I got Jesus. How could I want?
about on Sunday mornings. I mean, what do we really need to hear? What do we really need to be challenged on? Now, if I took everybody's request, you wouldn't believe what all I would be speaking on, okay? But understand, there comes a time that we really do need to be challenged as a church. You see, it's so easy to get comfortable and just go through the status quo. But the Lord, I don't believe, wants that. And I believe that that no one here has arrived, okay? So I feel like God wants to stretch us out a little bit as being better stewards of our time, of our talents, and yes, our treasure that he has given us. We need to risk more and we need to sacrifice more. For months, I have been thinking about this verse the story over in Genesis 18. And it's actually verse 14. And it says, Is anything too hard for God? And your response to that is? No. Understand that there is nothing that God wants to do that he can't do. Because where things are impossible with man, all things are possible with with God. Can you imagine, and you, can, you know that story if you've ever been in the Word of God much, that these three guys show up and they're talking to Abraham and then they say, hey, we're going to return in about a year and you're going to have a baby boy. Well, Sarah was 90. And she heard them and she laughed. And then she kind of lied that she didn't laugh. But anyway, is anything too hard for God? And then I recalled a book that I read a couple years ago, and so I just read it again. And the book is called All In, and that's what you'll see on the cover. You are one decision away from a totally different life. With that being said, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are one decision away from not only a different life, but a new home. Amen? We need to understand that this morning. I mean... I begin to wonder just how much God could do with a church that is all in. I mean, everything that we do. I think most of us here like sports. Some of us, quote, love sports. And this time of year, I get caught up. It's almost to be March Madness. And, you know, I love watching the Duke and North Carolina game. I've been to Duke and watched Duke play. And it's amazing that you see them do things. And they're, I mean, all throughout the game, they're all on cue. It's incredible, all the choreography that goes into that. And the reason they do it so well is that's part of their freshman orientation. I mean, they love their team. And I just watch and I see this school that gets all in behind their basketball team. What? could God do with a church that is all in together on everything? When did we start believing 
that God wanted us to, quote, play it safe. That faithfulness is holding the fort. You see, Jesus didn't die to keep us safe. He died to make us dangerous. Faithfulness is not holding the fort. It is storming the gates of hell. The will of God is not an insurance plan. It's a daring plan. The complete surrender of your life to the cause of Christ isn't radical. Now, hang on. It's normal. It isn't radical. It's normal. So it's time for all of us to quit living as if the purpose of life is to arrive safely at death. That's the way we live so many times. It's time to go all in and all out for the all in all. That's what we need to be doing. As I said last Sunday, we need to pack our coffin. And I'm going to talk about that more later. And uh, some of you who weren't here, I want to uh, re- uh, just tell you that again. How many of you, now I'll get to this before you think the pastor gambles here, has ever watched the World Series of Poker on ESPN? I was flipping channels one day, and man, I mean, I was just sitting there, and I just got caught up in this thing. I mean, last year, there were 7,200 people who paid a $10,000 entry fee to just get into the game. And then the prize money was a total of about 68000 as they sorted it out. And man, as I'd watch how it starts with this and this, and then, man, it got down to the nitty-gritty. And now there's just down to a few people... And then about that time, they're starting to put millions into the pot. And then finally, there's only two guys left. And then they just push all the chips into the middle of the table. And they go all in. Now, wow. That was that moment. And I started getting into it a little bit and thinking, wow. The drama there. But I listen, I can't think of a better image of what God is calling us to do. Have you yourself pushed all your chips into the middle of the table? Now, I don't, you know, the Bible talks about gambling. The Lord's against gambling, okay? I don't gamble, okay? But what a great illustration. People that we just push all of our chips in to the table. So have you gone in, all in, with God? Or are you holding out? Is there some part of you... That you're withholding from God. Well, here's my prayer for this series. That all of us would go all in. Let me ask you this again. Can you imagine a church where everybody is all in? You see, if we're all in relationally and missionally and financially and spiritually, if you go all in, is there anything, anything that we could not accomplish for God? Where everybody Is just all in with each other and with God. I believe that is what God has called us to do. So let me ask this question. Who's following God? You see, most people in most churches think they're following Jesus, but I'm not so sure about that. They may think they're following Jesus, but the reality is this. They have invited Jesus to follow them. They call him Savior, but they've never surrendered to him as Lord. So let me ask you a question. Who's following who in your life? Are you following Jesus? Or have you just invited Jesus to follow you? See, I would think that the vast majority of you would say, you know what? You're following Jesus, but the truth is you're not 100% sold out. Maybe you're half in and half out. Well, Luke chapter 6, verse 46, a very familiar verse is this. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? A valid question from the Lord Jesus himself. There was a British revivalist who issued a holy dare. Look at this verse. The world... Well, let me just say this before I get to the next verse. Do you remember a guy named Dwight L. Moody? And you remember Billy Graham, if you got to uh, follow up on some of his, uh, his funeral that he just planned out, what, 89, I think 10 years ago? And incredible. But Dwight L. Moody, who was a British revivalist, this is what he said. 
The world has yet to see what God will do with and for and through and in and by the man who is fully and wholly consecrated to him. The original hearer of that was Dwight L. Moody. Now listen to this. That call just didn't tickle his ears. It defined his life. It was his all-in moment. Have you ever just had that aha moment? Maybe this is yours. Let me tell you the importance of prayer. Don't miss this. It's the difference between the best you can do and the best God can do. For example, we're about to get ready to go to the Holy Land in less than two weeks. We're doing a trip there, some of us here in the church. And there's this place over there called Jericho. You remember the walls of Jericho. And you remember how they marched around it? How many times? Seven times. And man, then the walls come tumbling down. You see, you have to pray a circle around the promises of God the same way the Israelites circled Jericho. And you keep circling until he answers. But you can't just pray like it depends on God. You also have to work like it depends on you. You can't just draw the circle. You have to draw a line in the sand. As I said earlier, you are one decision away from a totally different life. Of course, it will probably be the toughest decision you'll ever make. But if you have the courage this morning to completely surrender yourself to the Lordship of Christ. I'm not talking about even coming to know Christ. For those of you who know Christ, I'm talking about completely, 100%, all in. If you'll commit that to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, there is no telling what God will do. All bets are off because all bets are on God. Anytime, anytime. God is about to do something amazing in our lives. He calls us to what? Consecrate ourselves to him. Set ourselves apart. That pattern was established right before the Israelites crossed the Jordan River and conquered the promised land. Look at this verse. Then Joshua said to the people, Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. You see, here's our fundamental problem. Don't miss this. We try to do God's job for him. We want to do amazing things for God. That sounds good, doesn't it? But we've got it backwards. God wants to do amazing things for us. That's his job, not our job. Our job is consecration. That's it. And if we do our job, God will most certainly do his. You see, this church... The church and school stuff is going to work out, but maybe not our way, but God's way. So let me ask you a question today. Is anything too hard for God? Do you remember Matthew 16, 18, when the Lord said to Peter, Upon this rock, I will build my Church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Guys, understand that God is all in. And we want to be all in to what the Lord wants to do here. Now, before I tell you what consecration is, let me tell you what it's not. Now, hear me, church. It's not going to church once a week. It's not having daily devotions. It's not keeping the Ten Commandments. It's not sharing faith with your friends. It's not giving God the tithe. It's not repeating the sinner's prayer. It's not volunteering for a ministry. It's not leading a small group. It's not raising your hands in worship. It's not going on a mission trip. The word consecrate means to set your Self apart. By definition, it means full devotion. It means you dethrone yourself and you enthrone Jesus as Lord of your life. That's exactly what it means. Consecration is going all in and all out for the all in all. And I think the greatest concern for most pastors 
is that people can go to church every week of their lives and never go all in with Jesus Christ. They can follow the rules, but never follow Christ. There's a group called the Pharisees. They knew the rules, but they never followed Christ. I'm afraid we've cheapened the gospel by allowing people to buy in without selling out. Church, do you really know what all ministries go on here? You see, when you give your tithe of 10%, the minimum that God instructs, 10%, it goes toward what you saw up here today with these children. It goes toward our students. It goes toward electricity. It goes toward buildings. It goes toward mission trips. Yeah, I can just go on and on and on. And it goes toward helping the school. You see, I've said this before. If everybody gave what the Lord said alone, just a 10% minimum, we would be having different conversations at business meetings. We would be having conversations about how many more missionaries can we send? How many more scholarships maybe can we help people in a school? Listen to me. We don't have a financial problem. We have a heart problem. Do we understand that? We don't have building problems. We have a heart problem. If I were to ask you today, if you've been a deacon here for the past 25 years, if you've been a school board member for the past 25 years, would you just stand up? And we're going to say, point the finger at whose fault that may be. I don't think that's God honoring. Do you understand? We're all in. We've got to get all in together. For those of you who are guests today, I apologize maybe for not clearing that up. But you know what? We have some things. We have some family business we're taking care of. And God's got the solution. And we're trying to help one another. And we're trying to come alongside one another. But once we get all in to what God wants to do, there is nothing that he can't do. Nothing at all, people. Listen to me. All in. We've made it too convenient and too comfortable. We've given people just enough Jesus To be bored out of their minds. But not enough to feel the surge of the holy adrenaline. That runs through their veins when they decide to follow him. No matter what. No matter where. No matter when. Listen. The longer I follow Jesus. The longer I'm convinced of this simple truth. God doesn't do what God does because of us. God does what God does in spite of us. All we have to do is stay out of his way. Look at the next verse. Luke 9, 23. And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. You see, the disciples knew what they signed up for. Now, sometimes you've done studies maybe, or you've heard of a certain disciple, the way they died. Well, let me just run it down for you, okay? And when I read these, now I want you to think to yourself. Bam, am I really all in? Here you go. James the greater, I mean the greater, was killed with a sword. Luke was hung by the neck from an olive tree. Doubting Thomas was pierced with a pine spear. Tortured with red hot plates and burned alive in India. Philip was tortured and crucified because his wife converted to Christianity while listening him preach. But Philip even continued preaching on the cross. Matthew was stabbed in the back in Ethiopia. Bartholomew was flogged to death in Armenia. James the Just was thrown off the southeast pinnacle of the temple in Jerusalem. Simon the Zealot was crucified by a governor of Syria. Judas Thaddeus was beaten to death with sticks in Mesopotamia. Matthias, who replaced Judas Iscariot, was stoned to death and beheaded. Peter was crucified upside down at his own request. John the Beloved is the only disciple to die of natural causes, but that's only because he survived his own execution. When a cauldron of boiling oil could not kill John, the emperor exiled him to the island of Patmos. He then returned to Ephesus where he wrote three epistles and died of natural causes. Every Christian should read Fox's book of martyrs. If you don't have that, I have one in my office. It's amazing about all the martyrs for Jesus. 
It redefines risk and sets the standard for sacrifice. You see, our normal is so subnormal that normal seems radical. That's sad. That's why, like, maybe if you would, go, if you can tomorrow night, to go see the Tortured for Christ movie at 7.30. And again, tickets will be out there. Look at Luke 9, 23 again in verse 24. And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. You see, you won't come alive in the truest and fullest sense until you die to self. And you won't find yourself until you lose yourself in the cause of Christ. Now, let me reiterate what I said last year about one-way missionaries, about packing your coffin. For those of you who weren't here, but those of you who were here, about a century ago, when missionaries would go to the South Pacific, they would pack all of their belongings in a coffin, not a suitcase. Because they knew they weren't coming back. Because every other missionary had been martyred there. A certain guy, A.W. Milwee, decided to go. He packed his belongings in the coffin. He didn't have a problem. He knew he was going to die, but he had already died to self a long time ago. That's what it calls. That's what it means to die to self. To take up your cross. And 35 years later, they buried him there in the mil middle of the village. And this is what it said on his tombstone. When he came, there was no light. When he left, there was no darkness. Are you all in to pack your coffin instead of your suitcase? Listen to me. Church, it's time to ante up. It's time to go all in. If Jesus is not Lord of all, then Jesus is not Lord at all. It's all or nothing. It's now or never. See, we have Americanized the gospel. When you try to add something to the gospel, you aren't enhancing it. Any addition is really a subtraction. The gospel in its purest form is as good as it gets. You see, we want God on our terms. But we don't get God that way. You know what we get? That's how we get false religion. You only get a relationship with God on his terms. You can take it or leave it. Paul defines it this way. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. So that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. Understand that the moment you bow your knee to the lordship of Christ, all of your sin is transferred to his account. Paid in full, and it was nailed to the cross over 2,000 years ago. But that's only half the gospel. Mercy is not getting what you deserve, the wrath of God. Grace is getting what you don't deserve, the righteousness of God. Everything you've done wrong is forgiven and forgotten. And everything Christ did, his righteousness is transferred to his account. And then God calls it even. Listen, the gospel cost us nothing, but it cost Jesus his life. We cannot buy it. We cannot earn it. It can only be received as a free gift, compliments of God's grace. So it costs nothing, but it demands everything. Don't miss that. And that's where most of us get stuck. Spirituals, no man's land. We are too Christian. Listen to this. We're too Christian to enjoy sin and too sinful to enjoy Christ. We've got just enough Jesus to be informed but not transformed. Big difference. You can take Psalms 84, 11 to the bank. No good thing does God withhold from those who walk uprightly. That's not Pastor Al. That's the Word of God. If you don't hold out on God, I can promise you this. God will not hold out 
on you. But it's all or nothing for all of him. Let me just put my cards on the table. I really don't think any, any of us have sacrificed anything for God. Because if you get back more than you gave up, have you really sacrificed anything at all? See, the eternal reward always outweighs the temporal, doesn't it? Huh? Always outweighs the temporal sacrifice. At the end of the day, judgment day, our only regret will be whatever we didn't give back to God. Now, Mark Batterson went on and he said, I can't prove this quantitatively, but I know it's true and I agree with him. The more you give away, the more you will enjoy what you have. If you give God the tithe, you'll enjoy the 90%, you keep 10% more. And if you want to double tithe and you want to give 20%, then you'll enjoy the 80% you living off of 20% more. But if you just want to keep giving and giving and giving, you're just going to enjoy more and more and more and more. You understand? Listen to me. You'll also discover that God will do more with your 90% or whatever yissin that's left than you can do with 100%. Most of us spend most of our lives accumulating the wrong things. We bought in to the consumerist lie that more is more. And I think of a little rhyme that doubled as a playground rule when I was a kid. Remember? Finders, keepers, losers, weepers. Well, it's the exact opposite in the kingdom of God. Finders, weepers, losers, keepers. Big difference, isn't it? Did you catch that? Do you remember the story of the rich young ruler? Mark 10, it talks about that in the Gospels, but Mark 10 is one of them. You remember when the rich man came to the Lord and said, Lord, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? He said, well, you know all the commandments. And he started naming some. He said, yeah, I've kept every one of them. He said, there's only one thing you like. He said, what's that? Go sell everything you have and give to the poor. And if you remember, the man ducked his head and he walked away. The rich young ruler is the epitome of religiosity. And his life is a warning to all of us. Now hear this. If we, if we hold out on God, we'll miss out on everything God wants to do in us, for us, and through us. Of course, the flip side is true as well. I can say, as Mark Battison said, I haven't met many people possessed by a demon, but I've met many people possessed by their possessions. They don't own things. Things own them. Now, let me go back to what I was saying about tithing. Because this month is about being all in. It's about mountain moving faith. Faith. It's about giving. It's about trusting God with your time, with your talent, with your treasure. Do you understand that there is no place, I've said it many times from this pulpit, in the Bible, where God promises. Listen. One verse where he says, test me, try me, and prove. And God has kept every promise in my life. What about yours? Every one of them. The rich, young ruler had everything we think we want. Rich, young, and a position of power. So here's the question. Why was he miserable? Easy answer. He was following the rules. But it wasn't following Jesus. Many of you, you maybe you're here today, you followed the rules. But you're not following Jesus. And I would have to say, I honestly believe that's true of far too many people in far too many churches. The rich young ruler may rank as one of the most religious people in Scripture. The Bible tells us 
He kept all the commandments. He did nothing wrong, but don't miss this. But you can also do nothing wrong and still do nothing right. By definition, righteousness is doing something right, but we've reduced it to doing nothing wrong. See, we focus on sins of commission. Don't do this. Don't do that. And you're okay. That's more hypocrisy than holiness. It's the sin of omission. What you would have, could have, should have done that breaks God's heart. And this is one of the saddest stories in Scripture because the rich young ruler had so much upside potential. The rich young ruler eventually became the old rich ruler. One of the most important examples of going all in is the story of the bags of gold, the talents. You remember that? Or Jesus gave one five, one three, one, one you know, the, the master. You remember that? And he came back, but we'll just talk about the one that buried it. The one. That's what he did. The others multiplied theirs. Now, so he comes back and what does he do? He goes, digs it up and say, hey, I didn't lose anything. Hey, I wasn't half bad during recession back then if you read the Bible. That's a pretty good return. He didn't lose. But you know what? He called him wicked. Wicked. That's what Jesus did. He wasn't willing to gamble on God. He didn't even any up. And that's the point of this parable. Faith is pushing all the chips into the middle of the table. You can't hedge your bet by setting aside one or two chips. It's all or nothing. And that's what Jesus challenged him to do. And that's what I'm challenging you to do this morning. Jesus said, look. If you want to be perfect, go sell your possessions and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. But we do exactly what he did. We focus on what Jesus asked him to give up, but we fail to consider what he offered up in exchange. Eternal life. Jesus invited the rich young ruler to follow him. And that's the point in this story we should grab a hold of. You see, the disciples lived in a day and age when the average person would never travel outside a 30-mile radius of where they grew up. Uneducated fishermen living within a, stone, a, a stone's throw of the Sea of Galilee. They traveled all over the ancient world and turned it upside down. I mean, think about it, man. They had a three-year internship with Jesus. They went camping. They went hiking. They went fishing. They went sailing. I mean, they had box seats to everything. They had backstage passes, man. They didn't just witness the miracles, the miraculous catch of fish. Listen to me. They caught it, cleaned it, fried it, and ate it. What about the water and the wine? What kind of price would you put on that? Watching it, drinking the water that Jesus turned into wine. What kind of price would you put on walking on water? The rich young ruler forfeited a wealth of experience because he couldn't let go of his possessions. Listen, church, we don't need to accumulate possessions. We need to accumulate experiences. Now, I'm going to close with a story. If you've lived in Lima at any length of time, you're going to know this man. Doesn't matter where he goes to church. No matter that. But his name is Stanley Tam. How many of you ever heard of him? United Plastics. 99 years old. He legally transferred 51% of the shares of his company to his senior partner named God. People said he was crazy and it couldn't be done. Took three lawyers to pull it off. He started his business with $37 in capital. When he gave his business back to God, annual revenues were less than $200,000. But he believed God would bless his business, and he wanted to honor God from the beginning. He felt convicted for keeping the 49%. So he divested himself from all of his shares. Now listen to this. This is what he said. A man can only eat one meal at a time, 
Now, that's true. I love to eat, but one meal at a time is all I can do. Wear only one suit of clothes at a time. Drive only one car at a time. All this I have. Church, isn't that enough? On January 15, 1955, every share of his stock was transferred to God, his senior partner. And Stanley became a salaried employee of the company he had started. To date, he has given away more than $120 million. You can tell me you're all in. But let me see your calendar and your credit card statement. They don't lie. How we spend our time and our money are the two best barometers of our true priorities. Here's my question. Is Jesus your senior partner? Is he? You're just one decision away from a totally different life. What risk do you need to take this morning? What sacrifice do you need to make? You know what some of us need to do? We need to come and put whatever that Isaac is on the altar. You need to throw down your staff like Moses. You need to get out of the boat like Peter. There comes a moment in, in life when you just have to throw caution to the wind. There comes a time when you just have to go all in. It's all or nothing. It's now or never. So church, this is my challenge this morning. If you're not all in, and you know there are things in your life that needs to be better, this altar is open today, and I want to call this church into a time of prayer. And if you're able to make it, I just want this whole altar to fill up today. Because God is about to do something so awesome for Lima Baptist Temple and Temple Christian School and all the ministries of this church if we can just understand that it takes us to get all in to His plan, not our plan, our ways are not his ways all the time. Thank the Lord. Amen. And understand today that there is nothing that Jesus wants to do that is too hard for him to do. Let's bow. Father, this morning, as I just opened up this altar, Lord, for your people to just come and just bow their knee, Lord, and just pray that this church as a whole, Lord, would just get all in. That, Father, they would just come and, Lord, they would bring everything they have in their lives today. Lord, they would come with their families. They would come with their friends. God, that we would just push our chips, Lord, to the middle of the table. And, Lord, we will hold nothing back. Father, I pray that today, Lord, your power would just fall on this place, Father. Help us to understand today that, Father, you want to see a church that is all in together. Lord, we thank you for the fellowship. We thank you for what you're doing. So God, now I pray that you would just help us to be more united today than we were even when we came in today. And it's your blessed name. I ask it all. Amen. Would you stand? Would you sing? Would you come? Would you pray today? We are so glad that you joined us today. God wants to do so much for you and through you, and we want to hear about it. So take a moment to share your story with us at mystory@lbtlima.org. If you would also like to contribute financially to this ministry, you can do so at limabaptisttemple.org. Or you can download our church app available for iPhone and Android users. Thanks again for joining us. We hope you enjoy today's message.